and a very warm welcome to this episode of the Sanctuary Sunday Lesson. I'm Pastor Gary Ellis. You know, I'm really very eager to present today's lesson, which I've entitled God and Country, because I believe that Christians and politics can run on parallel tracks, especially if it's in the lane that God has given you to run in. And I also believe there are key perspectives that can make Christ followers far more effective and introduce much longer lasting change as we view some very important perspectives that are found in the scriptures and in the testimony of Jesus. You see, it's my purpose to invite you to think about possibly some subjects of faith that you may not have previously given much serious consideration. Oh, you consider them real, but stopping and allowing them to really soak in, maybe not so much. Only you can determine that. You see, expanding my uh, perspectives has really produced for me very positive fruit in my own life and attitudes. And I'm quick to add, I am still learning. And on a parallel track, a fresh sense of wisdom I've received that's really helping me make more significant inroads for healthy and productive relationships with others. In fact, our our relationship with other uh, others, and maybe especially those with whom we have some disagreement or a lot of disagreement, it's really an important part of the equation, isn't it? To personal and national healing and health, both in our natural circumstances and politics and from the spiritual perspective of where our power actually resides and our wisdom. Although I do believe you would agree with me, don't you, that the source of everlasting change is in fact spirit-centered, yeah? So, let's take a look at a teaching given by Jesus in Luke chapter 6. It's pretty radical. It's really pretty counterculture, even in a lot of Christian culture. But I think we need to look at that. All right. Luke chapter 6 and verses 27 to 36. Now, I warn you, this is pretty radical. But to you who are listening, see, a lot of people don't listen. Or they don't hear what he's saying. Maybe they hear the words, but don't take them to heart. So, and that's what he, what he means here. If you're listening and want to take this to heart, I want to say something to you. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Okay. Bless those who curse you. Yeah, okay. Pray for those who mistreat you. And I don't think he means, Lord, I pray for them now. Would you bless them with a brick? Uh, maybe put a little velvet on it, but make it a heavy brick anyway. <laughs> anyway, turn to them the other cheek. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Okay, now, Jesus, you're getting radical. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. All right, now, Jesus, let's, let's, look, let's, let's consider this for a moment, because I'm sure there must be exceptions to this. Perhaps. See what the Holy Spirit says to you. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even if sinners love those who love them, and if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. Verse 35, but love your enemies. Oh, I love them. I just don't like what they're doing. Wait a minute. Let the Holy Spirit speak to us on this. I'm not going to tell you how to describe love in your own life. 
but I want you to allow the Holy Spirit to speak into that. But love your enemies. Wait a minute, I don't like this next part. I can agree with it theologically, but as it works out in my life, I'm not so sure. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to who? The ungrateful and the wicked. Has he not been, I know he has been kind to me when I have been ungrateful. Has he not been kind to you? I know that uh, sometimes really wickedness and how it's, uh, you know, because part of the way that Jesus described wickedness was in murmurings and disputings. And I have been involved in that. And he was kind to me anyway. All right. That's a tough pill to swallow, but let's keep on going. On a natural, practical level, the governance of our society is, in fact, political. It is a political arena. And in a variety of ways and means, needs Jesus representers, wouldn't you agree? Let me inject a thought here. Our country, I'm going to stipulate this. That's a courtroom term. It, it means I'm going to agree to it. Our country is in, in fact, desperate need for positive change on the political front, as well as several other fronts. And, uh, it is a fact. I will stipulate. We need to stipulate. It's the truth. There is corruption all over the place. And that corruption is painted with a very broad brush. But our attitudes and actions create a dynamic that introduces and encourages something that is a very positive kingdom of God change. The dynamic Christ followers need to introduce is something that I would call the Jesus dynamic. What would you say? Agreed? See, I believe that a prayer that was introduced in the 40s, I believe it could have been in the 30s, but to Alcoholics Anonymous contains good wisdom as we proceed. And the prayer went like this. Do you remember that, that prayer, the serenity prayer? God grant me the serenity or the peace, the well-being, to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Now, I think that a key element that is too often deficit is the phrase, <laughs> and the wisdom to know the difference. Of course, the serenity prayer is not found in the Bible as such, but in principle, it is on several levels. And we want to present some of that in this lesson. Now, as, as we are considering change of being a, of a, la, a, a long-lasting nature, I believe we have to take serious look at where and what we consider to be our power sources. I've already mentioned that. I don't mean the easily quoted orthodoxy of, which means doctrinal acknowledgments, but the orthopraxy of, meaning daily actions. Wouldn't you agree that we need to elevate our game to better combining our doctrinal acknowledgement with our daily attitudes? Amen. Wouldn't you agree you see, along this line, let me insert a short scene from Rocky III, where Mickey is talking to Rocky about his upcoming fight. Let's look at that. Let's put it this way. You know, three years ago, you were supernatural. But then the worst thing happened to you that could happen to any fighter. 
you got civilized. So Mickey said something I think is very applicable in what we're talking about today. The worst thing happened to you, you got civilized. You were supernatural, but you got civilized. Now, I believe that diagnosis is not far off from what's happened to so many of us today as naturally supernatural sons and daughters of God. Now, now please understand, my focus is not to cast aspersions and blame at the church or individual followers of Christ. That has no hope of power in it. That's too often attack that many people are taking right now. There's no power in that, casting blame, casting guilt. But if we take this from the perspective of a doctor diagnosing an illness, they have to start by finding the root of the weakness before they can accurately treat it, yes? So, moving forward, let's look at some of those biblical perspectives now that we have suggested an area that has become a weakness for us. In Matthew 4, we observe the three wilderness temptations. Do you remember that story where Satan was tempting Jesus in the wilderness? And he took it to three different levels. In one of them, Satan took Jesus to a high mountain and he showed him the kingdoms of the world and said that he would give, uh, he would give Jesus power in them in exchange for Jesus bowing down and worshiping him. You remember the story? All right, what was Jesus' response to that? Well, it wasn't, okay, let's consider that. No, he said, get away from me. I will submit myself to and worship no one but God, no other God but God alone and his kingdom alone. Now, please hear me. I do not believe this example is an indication that we as followers of Christ should not be involved in healthy political pursuits. What to me it does say is that our involvement must come from the perspective that our, our work, um, our worship, and our wisdom must reflect the nature and the fruit of the kingdom of God. All right? Are you with me so far? Next reflection. Let's consider the donkey factor. And we're going to, we're going to go to an excerpt, about a minute excerpt of uh, another video here. I'm going to let Heidi Baker introduce this one. Now, I've been filled many, many times, but I'm telling you that time, that seven days, seven nights, I don't think there's ever, I don't know, I'm ready for more. I'm ready for more. There is more, there is more. I'm ready for more. But when God does something like that, there's a sovereign deposit on your life. There's a sovereign deposit where God starts speaking to you things that you could never, ever do. You could never accomplish. You understand, you know, this might offend some of you, but here I go. You understand that you're the donkey. Yes. Now, I've gotten in big trouble with uh, big cameras on my face where they say, could you just, as a woman speaker, speak about women's rights? And I'm like, if God can use a donkey, they just... <laughs> It flips them out. They just like, sweet Lord. And, and they prayed it wasn't live, but it is. You know, it's too late. Suck it back in. No. I'm like, I'm not trying to rise up. Now, please, again, a statement like you understand that you're the donkey will definitely trigger some. May I say that, knowing Heidi, it does not mean that women need to submit to abusive and subjugated male authority. And I certainly didn't use this clip for that purpose. I'm not on that track at all. What I believe it's, uh, really believe it's pointing to is the attitude that Jesus took in his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. In fact, it points to me that Jesus engaged 
in the position that he knew would clearly challenge Roman rule. Politics. And that is my point. In the times of Jesus, conquerors celebrated their conquests by entering on the backs of white stallions. Because you see, that was a demonstration of power for them. A demonstration of conquest, victory, of authority. Now, I believe Jesus intentionally challenged his environment by not only his political environment, it would also have been a challenge to his uh, the religious environment because the Pharisees were all about subjugating people and running rampant control, firm control over them, like is in too much of the church circles today, I'm afraid. But it challenged definitely the political environment by choosing to ride on a donkey. You see, donkeys, and here's the point, donkeys were work animals. They served. They were animal kingdom servants. You see, I believe Jesus was demonstrating that his triumph, his kingdom, was made up of those who had servant hearts. I believe the scriptures reveal that the real power behind the power are like the little finger in a hand. I did, I did a short uh, Facebook encouraging word video last week presenting the fact that 50%, uh, you'll find this fascinating if you didn't see that video, 50% of the strength of a person's human hand, which is a symbolic representation of power and of blessing, is in the little finger. In kingdom language, it's powerful to be one who has the attitude of blessing through service. You supply 50% of the power. You are the power behind the power. The servant attitude is the power behind the power. And I believe that same principle holds true as we involve ourselves in political change to improvement, to the kind of change that is, in fact, long-lasting, rather than candy cane lasting, like sweet for the moment, but it ultimately changes all over again. All right. I th uh, my final thought for today, because once again, we've run out of time, and I'm going to be taking this up as part two next week, because as we allow Jesus' story and other Bible principles saturate our consciousness, we are really more filled with hope and wisdom for our task as we correctly and legitimately endeavor to make the God kind of change that is uh, desperately needed in our country. By the way, we must also understand that healthy, long-lasting change is a marathon. It's not a sprint. And that's one of the reasons that people don't get maybe as involved in, the, in that which causes positive change because it's so much easier to do those things that are very easy uh the sprint the quick things the quick reactions but response is very often a marathon so for our last example for today let's look at jeremiah 29 i, I believe this points to what god was declaring to those who'd been carried away into Babylonian captivity. He was saying, go forward and establish your lives and work in ways that will practically serve and prosper your country. You see, that's in Jeremiah chapter 29. And he gave them instructions on how to function. I'm going to let you look that up for yourself for time's sake here, because we're running out of time. But it would be in about verses 4 and 5. It's same chapter that Jeremiah also then referred to in verses that we like. It's not my will that you should do anything but prosper. Jeremiah 29, 13, 14, and through there. Many of you watching, as a matter of fact, uh, part of this, by the way, was prayer. And many of you watching do pray for our country, that it may go well. Because he said, do normal things. 
Do that which is establishing your lives and is working in ways that will practically serve and prosper your city and country. You are prayers. Many of you watching me are. You are prayers. You do pray. Uh, well, you, you know, some people say they are. We believe in praying. But I believe that a lot of you watching really do take that seriously. But right now, I'm speaking about attitude. Daily life attitude. Action attitude. You see, I don't see in this command from the Lord to rise up against their captors in any form. Is there a place for educating others regarding corruption? And I'm sure Babylon, uh, Babylon had plenty of it. They had it in spades. But I take it from the prophetic word that Jeremiah delivered that the bulk of their attitude and actions were to make their lives and the lives of their captors yeah, and their captors, better to bless them. In fact, if we just read a couple of verses further on down, the next verse is Jeremiah actually references the prophets in Jerusalem and Babylon that were falsely, he called them false prophets that were not delivering the word. Uh, there, you see, there was... In Babylon at that time, history tells us, there was a lot of internal strife going on in the Babylonian government. And what these other prophets were declaring, which we, we can learn from other places in Scripture and also in history, what they were declaring that this captivity would be short-lived and that God was about to turn everything over. He was going to turn that captivity over and get them right back to the land that they needed to be in of his promise. And Jeremiah said, no, you, no, that's not what God is saying. So it seems like we may be facing a marathon rather than a sprint if we follow the principles that the scriptures, in, it seems to me, most places really lay out and the testimony of Jesus. Here's a fact. God is my brothers and sisters, my, my Lord is on the move. He invites us to be on the move with him as we represent Jesus with our attitudes and actions in pursuing his glory for our God and our country. Be blessed and be a blessing. Until next time. <laughs>